Sneakers, they're everywhere, an integral part of modern existence. They're a global phenomenon with a surprising history, transcending religion, culture, and ideology. And today, sneakers are an underground subculture where no price is too high for the right pair. Buy a couple things, trade, sell. Want to know where to find the perfect kicks? I'm going to take you around the block and around the world to unlock the secrets to sneakers. It has a brain right here. So loosen your laces for a while. The rubber's about to hit the road as I make you a sneaker genius. Hi, I'm Daniel Wilson, and I want to know everything. With a PhD in robotics, I tend to see the world a little differently. So I'm going everywhere, finding the hidden side of everyday things, revealing it all in the works. Do you even know anybody who doesn't own sneakers? Men, women, babies, grandparents, triathletes, couch potatoes. Sneakers are fixtures of modern life, taken for granted as much as the ground they pound. But how much do you really know about them? Where they come from, what they're made of, where they're going? Now is the time to find out. It's a $26 billion a year industry that's doubled in the last 15 years. Sneakers are a worldwide phenomena starting from their birth. Usually designed in the Western world and manufactured abroad, they take a trip around the globe before they ever even hit store shelves. This pair of high-performance shoes was conceived by biomechanical engineers in Washington, then constructed 5,000 miles away out of 100 parts and 10 different materials. In your lifetime, you will probably spend nearly $10,000 on sneakers. Sneakers fuel a worldwide fitness craze that drives fashion and inspires pop culture. To understand why sneakers have become such a cultural and economic force, you first have to appreciate the evolutionary genius of the human foot and a key feature that goes back two million years. Meet Australopithecus, our African ancestor. Australopithecus had a triangular body, long arms, and short legs. He was built for tree climbing as well as walking. But over thousands of years, the species evolved shorter arms and longer legs, much better for running. But why was running so important in evolutionary terms? I checked with an anthropologist from Harvard. Imagine you're a big-bodied Homo erectus two million years ago, and you're hungry. And importantly, you have a very big brain, and brains are very expensive to grow. How are you going to pay for that great, big, huge brain? By eating high-quality protein, meat. That's why our ancestors started hunting on the African plains. How would you kill an animal when all you had was maybe a sharpened wooden stick, or a club, or a sharp bit of stone? And the answer is endurance running. So if a human hunter two million years ago can chase a wildebeest or a kudu or some animal and make it gallop for more than 10 or 15 minutes in the heat, that animal will go into hyperthermia and you can then kill it without any technology. Endurance running gave our ancestors a critical advantage and the foot evolved. Human feet have 52 bones. That's 25% of the total skeleton. And they're shaped to enhance one key biological feature that literally puts the spring in our step, the arch. When you're running, your arch functions as a spring. It actually collapses. As it collapses, there are all these elastic elements in the arch. They store up energy, and then they recoil pushing you up into the air. Amazing. We can thank our arches for the existence of the human race. Springy arches helped ensure that when our ancestors ran out for food, they didn't become lunch. So how do sneakers fit in? The average person's feet take 70,000 steps a week. Here's the downside to our evolution. 
Over time, our arches lose elasticity so that kinetic energy is transferred to the shins and knees, eventually creating chronic pain and debilitating osteoarthritis. Until 150 years ago, footwear did little to prevent that damage. Until sneakers came to the rescue with help from a revolutionary material. Look at your shoes. Rubber. Natural rubber, also known as latex, was first used by native South Americans to waterproof the wooden paddles they used to navigate the Amazon. It wasn't until Charles Goodyear patented his sulfur vulcanizing process in 1844 that rubber was stretched past its natural limits and into a new world of toughness and flexibility. Today, Goodyear's name is stamped on tires, but Charles used to be known for his shoes. In the 1840s, he founded Goodyear Metallic Rubber Shoe Company, and vulcanized rubber met foot for the first time. You can't talk about sneakers without talking about vulcanized rubber. Natural rubber is soft when it's warm and brittle when it's cold, but the vulcanization process takes natural rubber and combines it with sulfur and steams the two under pressure for a few hours. The resulting material is weatherproof, elastic, and easily mated with other materials. <clears throat> Vulcanized rubber was a miraculous, durable material that could absorb shock, enhance our arches, and protect our feet and legs against long-term damage. Now that's something you can make a sneaker out of a miracle shoe with the promise of ending a two million year affliction. And the rest is history. Let's have a look at the sneaker family tree. The first recognizable sneaker is called a plimsoll. This Neanderthal sneaker was developed in the late 1800s. The name's rooted in the fact that the sneaker has a dark band that runs along the sole that resembles the plimsoll line on a ship, which marks the proper water line on the hull. How basic was this sneaker? The right and left shoe were exactly the same. Convenient, huh? It was basically a uni sneaker. In 1916, the US Rubber Company developed the first mass-marketed, mass-produced sneaker, Keds. Ed, Ed, Ed. Just a year later, advertising executive Nelson McKinney is widely credited with coming up with the term sneakers. He remarked that, the soles of Keds were so quiet that you could use them to sneak around. And thus, the sneaker is officially born. In 1917, the same year the term sneaker was coined, Marquis M. Converse and his Massachusetts-based shoe company put out the first performance basketball shoe, Converse All-Star. Sneakers steadily grew in popularity for the next 50 years, but their basic morphology stayed the same until their evolution suddenly exploded. In the late 1960s, a couple of old track and field buddies start selling Japanese running shoes out of the trunk of their car. After 10 years of tinkering, one of them decides to pour rubber into a waffle iron and comes up with the sole for a revolutionary new running shoe. Nike is born. Then, in the 1970s and 80s, sneaker technology catapulted forward with innovations like the dynamic heel cradle and midsole wedges to protect the arch. NASA invented soles filled with pressurized air. Sneaker companies ran with the idea and sales hit the stratosphere, leaving us with the modern sneaker. But despite the countless styles, they all have the same three basic parts, the outsole, the midsole, and the upper. The outsole gives the sneaker its trademark traction. The midsole provides cushioning and support. Finally, the upper is a breathable mesh material. Those three main parts are made up of smaller components. The tip, the toe box, the vamp, the midfoot, the tongue, the collar, and the heel counter. Each element designed to work with the natural movement of your feet and protect your body. But how far can sneaker technology go to assist the human stride and keep your feet healthy? At Atrex Labs, they're treading into new technology to solve an age-old problem. So over time, you can develop medical problems from having the wrong shoe. You certainly have a better chance at preventing injuries by wearing shoes that really match your feet. In a world of six and a half billion people, no two pairs of feet are alike. Choosing the right sneaker is key. Check out the iStep SP5000. 
a sophisticated sensing device that precisely measures three essential elements of your feet. Shoe size, pressure points, and arch type. I step up to find the perfect sneaker. This is like Dance Dance Revolution for adults. And with no dancing.